All right, well, we welcome you all out to uh, the SBE meeting here today. We're very excited to have our guest lecturer, Maricela Sanchez-Nagel, uh, agreed to join us. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we're really excited about the student chapter established just before the semester ended last semester. And uh, I've written up here on the board my email address. If any of you are interested in officially joining the student chapter, we'd love to have you. Uh, just go ahead and send me an email, and I can let you know how that works out. Uh, so today, like I said, we're, we have Mari Sala with us, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce her, and then we'll let her get started. And she's going to give her presentation, uh, and then afterwards, we'll, we'll have some question and answer. So Dr. Sanchez-Nagel is currently general manager and principal engineer with Itasca Houston. She has more than 20 years of oil and gas industry experience in geomechanics for near well bore and reservoir geomechanics applications. She started her career at that. The Technology Center of PDVSA, which is Petroleos of uh, Venezuela, and worked there for 15 years. She then became president of Global Geo Solutions, an independent geomechanics consulting company in Latin America. Later, she worked for GMI for two years before coming to Costa Houston as general manager in 2007. Manitala has worked on many geomechanical projects around the world, has presented at numerous geomechanics schools throughout North and South America is currently on the 2013 ARMA Program Committee and is currently serving as a 2012-2013 SPE Distinguished Lecturer. Maritella and her husband have six children, three of which are studying petroleum engineering, one in psychology, one in statistics, and one in theater arts. Maritella was a volleyball player for Venezuela's national team and currently enjoys Zumba and ballroom dancing. And with that, we'll go ahead and welcome Maritella. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. So um, I am very happy to have this opportunity to uh, enjoy with you guys. And I hope this presentation uh, gets you excited about petroleum engineering and uh, numerical modeling for unconventional. So uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, greet and thank uh, the Distinguished Lecturer program for SPE who has been sponsoring all these lectures and uh, I've been around the US uh, talking with a lot of people and getting the perspective about the industry from several uh, sites you know from landowners to engineers service companies and also students so I think uh, it has been very very good for me to get all this perspective okay so uh, let me start with the presentation and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, hydraulic fracturing stimulation for unconventional resources from a very particular point of view which is geomechanics and uh, what we consider are the main physics that should be in the model so we can predict and essentially get some understanding of the very complex uh, processes here. Um, so let's talk about what is the industry uh, doing, how is the industry developing this unconventional place? Number one technology is the multi-stage hydraulic fracturing of horizontal wells and you may have uh, read in the papers or heard about this technology uh, and all the environmental issues but essentially the industry is uh, spending billions of dollars in this type of technology and uh, sadly we're still using trial and error procedures and uh, because the, the tools that are available are not really getting to help us in the design. We're collecting a lot of data, we're looking at trends and we're monitoring with micro seismic. So the idea here is that we're going to look at some of these issues uh, from the geomechanics point of view because um, the number one question that a completion engineer uh, have in this type of development are stage spacing, number of stages and how uh, close they should be, what is the volume that is going to be put in the treatment, the fluid and propens that we're going to pump the stage rate and the fluid viscosity. And all these issues for the conventional uh, realm were very well known and we have a very mature industry that knows how to do that. 
but in the unconventional, with this heterogeneous natural refractor reservoirs, shale reservoirs, uh, we essentially don't know how to do it very well. Um, because we cannot, we don't know, we don't understand very well how the completion is going to be affected by these natural fractures. And uh, definitely with nano Darcy permeability, we need to stimulate those natural fracture networks. We need to have them to cooperate with the production of the wellbone. So uh, let's talk a bit about natural fractures before we go forward with the models. Um, just a brief introduction about natural fractures and rock, fracture rock masses. And um, you know, uh, fractures, natural fractures are caused by stresses, maybe mechanical stresses or thermal stresses or uh, hydraulic uh, stresses caused by fluid flow. So this is a couple phenomena. And because of the heterogeneity of the rocks and the geometry of the structures, we may have very complex patterns. For example, here in this picture to the left, you can see that there is a strike slip, slip fold. And then the natural fractures are curving, are changing in the uh, geometry and orientation when it gets closer to the fold. We can also see changes in intensity of the natural fractures uh, depending on the mechanical properties of the rock. So uh, what this is telling us is that each unconventional play is unique, and uh, what works for in one play may not translate weight to another. Okay, So natural fractures are variable in size. It may be to the in the kilometer scale or very isolated microscopic feasors. All that all that can happen. Uh, these uh, produce very complex flow patterns, and also the natural fractures are deformable. So these fractures may close, they may open, they may shear uh, as pressure and stresses change in the rock mass. And also, they may have mechanical, variable mechanical properties depending on the mineralization, excuse me, <coughs> and the nature of the surfaces of these uh, natural fractures. Also, when we look at the fluid flow characteristics, if we go to a, the most simple model we can have, which is a parallel plate, and we uh, describe the fluid flow in this uh, setting, we, uh, I would like to call the attention to you that uh, the aperture of this natural oh. factor, this A factor, is uh, to the cube. So very small changes in fracture aperture will affect very much the fluid flow. Are we doing good, John? Yeah, I'm, somebody else just joined. There's a little bit of feedback. Um, Steve, I'm going to put you on mute, OK? OK. OK. <coughs> You're good. OK. OK, let's go ahead then. So uh, I was saying, uh, talking about how the apertures of these fractures can affect very much the fluid flow. And these apertures can change as the pressures change, change in the setting and in the uh, rock mass, as we drill wells and as we inject and produce hydraulic fractures. OK, the other thing that I want to call your attention to is the mechanical behavior of these natural fractures. And I will, for that, present this um, experimental setting in which we have a block and a natural fracture. And then we um, we will put a normal force as is presented there, and we will try to shear that block, uh, applying shear stresses to move this block. And uh, also, we may have some uh, fluid pressure in the fracture. If we plot uh, the shear stresses versus the shear displacement, under a specific um, normal force, we will need a, a shear stress to make that 
block move, the upper block move along this natural fractor. If we increase that normal force, this is very intuitive that we will need a higher shear stress to move that block and so on if we keep on increasing this. So for now, just uh, let me tell you that when you decrease the spacing of the hydraulic fractors in a horizontal wellbore, you are essentially increasing the normal folds over the natural fractures that may be in that rock mass. But also, you may be increasing the fluid pressure, and that will allow the, uh, <clears throat> the fracto to shear under uh, lower shear stresses. So this combination um, is something that we need to keep in mind to understand uh, how these fractures are going to behave, because essentially what we want to do is to have these natural fractures uh, to shear, to be stimulated, to open, and uh, to get fluid and hopefully propend in those natural fractures so they can cooperate with the production towards the wellbore. Okay. So another important thing to keep in mind about natural fractures is that this is a very undersampled system compared to the heterogeneity of it. Uh, because we're taking information from wells and probably image logs and cores and seismic, but still we have a very, uh, very um, undersampled system, right? So in that case, we want to collect all the data we have from images uh, in the well, core seismic attributes, well testing, outcrops, anything that can give us information about uh, the geometry, uh, orientation, inclination, intensity, apertures, properties of these natural fractures, and construct a statistical representation of the system, what we call a discrete fracture network, or DFN, and then, um, you know, try to understand along the wellbore how these fractures are distributed, if they cluster or not, and then use the models in a more sound way. So understanding the, the fracture system is a very important part of the business, right? Because ultimately, we want to understand the role of the heterogeneities and the discontinuities and how this hydraulic fracture will propagate. What I'm showing you here is uh, just a picture from this paper, Fisher and Warpinski, of a mine back experiment. So they, they created hydraulic fractures and then mined back and you know took a look at what happened. And in this case, we have here the well bore and then a hydraulic fracture that is upsetting and you know growing in a very in a pattern that's very rough. And when it gets to a natural fracture, it is splitting. So we have two hydraulic fractures here propagating at the same time. So this type of complexity is what we're looking, what we're trying to understand and hopefully model to be able to predict and optimize. Okay. So when we see all this complexity, all this um, uh, heterogeneity, we uh, the industry has come up with some empirical knowledge that help that has helped us help us design and define how we're going to do this business better. And I would like to talk about some of this what we call empirical knowledge. So the industry is using the concept of brittleness. Uh, you know, we're looking for brittle shales, and uh, we are describing this brittleness uh, with two parameters, which is Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio like deformability or stiffness parameters, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, also the concept of stimulated reservoir volume, which uh, is measured uh, through the micro seismic cloud that is monitored ar around the well bores during the stimulation, and also the concept, concept of creating additional complexity. Right, so let's look at all these, or let's challenge these concepts through a geomechanics uh, optic. So we have here uh, that brittleness is a concept that uh, we know, like from the laboratory and also from the field. And in the laboratory, we see 
experimentally that some rocks, depending on their confining pressure of the test and the temperatures, may behave in a brittle manner, so they break very clearly. But uh, other rocks behave in a ductile manner, so the specimen bulges and there's not a clear fracture in the in the specimen. So we, we this is the way we characterize it in the laboratory. We also see in the field that stiffer rocks have more natural fractures. So this is a concept that is clear. But the issue is that the way the industry is using it, like uh, a, a, a function of these two parameters, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, measured from sonic, sonic log, uh, somehow doesn't really make sense from the geomechanics point of view. So um, you know, here I'm presenting, for example, this uh, log in which we have an image log in a horizontal wellbore. We have this brittleness coefficient, which is, as I said, a function of uh, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, a multiplication of this uh, coefficient. And, and then, you know, they define, okay, this is a high uh, brittleness coefficient. We're going to put one of our stages of hydraulic fracturing in this point. So uh, what I'm going to do now is to challenge this brittleness coefficient concept through uh, a uh, discrete element model, so through a model that I'm going to show here, in this case, a simple 2D model. Uh, this is a top view, and I'm representing here the natural fractures as this plane in green, right? In between these fractures, we have blocks that have uh, properties that we're going to assign, and uh, we can assign also properties to this uh, fractor plane. So we have the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, which, which is essentially uh, what we're trying to uh, do parametric analysis for the br uh, brittleness coefficient, and also the fracture properties, the friction and the cohesion, and then the stress ratio, uh, sigma, the horizontal stre principal stresses, the maximum and the minimum components here. And of course, uh, we're going to um, model a hydraulic fracture here, which we have uh, simulated by imposing a net pressure, right? So uh, this is a top view, and this is like one of the wings of a hydraulic fracture. So we have, this is a quarter of symmetry here. So we're going to run this model, and we're going to see how the natural fractures behave from the deformation point of view. So in this case, this red, uh, lines here are showing to us which fractures, when we simulated this hydraulic fracture, uh, got sheared or deformed or failed in shear. So um, in this case, sorry about that, these sheared uh, fracture planes also are like a proxy to the micro seismicity because what really the geophones can hear when we monitor microseismic is the shear event. So let's think about that in this way. So this case, we're using a very low Poisson's ratio of 0.1, which gives us, for this particular case, a brittleness coefficient uh, high of 95, which is a high number. And we're going to compare it with another case in which we have a low brittleness coefficient uh, for a Poisson's ratio or Point four in this case. So what we see here in these results is that there's not much difference between the sheared uh, area, let's call it that way, in this case, high brittleness coefficient, versus the sheared area in this case in which we have a low fracture coefficient, uh, brittleness coefficient. So uh, when we now go to do this parametric analysis now with Young's modulus, and we have a change in uh, an order of magnitude of Young's modulus, we don't see either big differences in how this system has been stimulated from the shear point of view. Right. So uh, when we go to analyze the effect of friction in the natural fractures for a single brittleness coefficient, now we see a big difference when we uh, change the friction angle. So this is a parameter that is definitely very important in how we can achieve this stimulation of natural fractures. 
And the same thing with with the stress ratio, right? So as a small conclusion here, a preliminary conclusion, we see that this brittleness coefficient really do not reflect a property that reflects uh, how this fractal network is stimulated. So this, the brittleness as defined by the industry and how it's being used right now, okay? Uh, so this is the first term that I was uh, trying to talk to you about. Let's talk to you now about the complexity. So the complexity in the industry is understood as the ability to create and enhance this natural fracture system uh, to the advantage of the production. And we definitely see uh, very different cases in the field. For example, here and to the right in the Barnate case, this is a top view of a vertical well that has been stimulated uh, by hydraulic fracturing. And when the, uh, the microseismic is monitored, you can see a big fat cloud of events around this well bore. When we do the same thing in Marcellus with the same treat treatment, same uh, uh, type of fluid, same uh, volume, we see a very different behavior. We, we see a very linear um, microseismic event following what it looks like a very li linear hydraulic factor, uh, not as in the previous case. So we want to understand uh, why this happened or what is the microseismic uh, events telling us in each case. So, um, the industry is telling us you need to put more stages, closer stages, to really um, to get the complexity to happen, to in, to increase this uh, damage of the rock and increase the complexity. So, to try to analyze this and you know to try to understand this, I'm going to pose to you the situation. Let's uh, think about a horizontal wellbore here. And we have a stress field like the following. We have a vertical stress and two horizontal principal stresses, maximum and the minimum. And then uh, we are drilling this horizontal wellbore in the direction of sigma h min because we want the hydraulic fractures to be perpendicular to the wellbore axis, right? And so we can do several transverse fractures along that wellbore, several stages. So when we create these hydraulic fractures and we prop them, we are inflating, we are deforming the rock, and we are increasing the stresses in that direction. So we are increasing the sigma h mean. We are also increasing the maximum and the vertical, but, but in a less degree. So the main thing we see is the sigma h mean is increased. And we see this in the field. We can measure this in the field, and I'm going to show some examples of this field data. So that's what we're doing. We create one stage, we increase sigma h mean, then we create another stage, sorry. And what we want to know is what would be the effect on the natural fractures. Are they going to be uh, stimulated or are they going to be essentially stabilized? And here we have to remember the experimental setting that I showed to you before in which if you increase the normal forces, it's going to be uh, more difficult to shear this natural fractures. But at the same time, if we can put pore pressure in those fractures, then we're going to be able to shear them. So this is a competing uh, mechanism. So I'm going to show now some models that will quantify the increment in sigma h mean. This is the top view of a horizontal wellbore here. This is stow, this is heel. And uh, we are creating several transverse hydraulic fractures in, along the wellbore and measuring the increment of the horizontal minimum stress. So here, uh, when we go to the warm colors, the red means that we have increased the sigma h min. If we plot the, this values of uh, increment of sigma h min along the wellbore, uh, we can see this type of pattern. So we have uh, some cumulative increment of, of the lateral stresses, and then if the 
stages are separated, then you can may have a decrease. This is the change of sigma H mean along the wellbore length. So this is the phenomenon that we observe in the field. Uh, we also can calculate the maximum shear stresses that we are imposing under this situation. In this case, the red means lower values. So we're doing two things. We're increasing the normal stresses, the sigma H mean, and we are decreasing the maximum shear, which means that we, if we put this stage, this stage is too close, we are going to stabilize those natural fractures that we want to stimulate. So we have to be careful and we have to be conscious of the phenomenon that's occurring. Okay, this is some field data of uh, what's called the instantaneous shutting pressure uh, measured in each of the stages along the horizontal wellbore from toe to heel. And what we are measuring here is when we shut in the pumps, there's a pressure that we can uh, measure that's an indication uh, upper limit of the horizontal minimum horizontal stress. And you can see that as we increase the numbers of stages, we may increase this value this magnitude a lot. In some cases, it's not a big increment. In some cases, it can be very large. So this is field data. And uh, you may have also, if your increment of the sigma H mean is large enough, you may have a switch in the magnitude of, the, of in the stresses. So the minimum is no longer the minimum. It becomes the maximum. And you may have a rotation of the orientation of the uh, hydraulic fracturing like in this case. If you see here in this plot, you have the instantaneous shutting pressure from stage 1 to 10, and the value is increasing. You have 1, 2, 3, 4 stages with uh, transfer fractures, and suddenly you have a change in the orientation of the hydrofrac and a decrease in the sigma H min. And, and then you may have combinations of things. So this really happens in the field, and you have to understand how this is going to affect the performance of your wellbore. In this particular field, because of the high stresses induced, they are having uh, several wells with uh, casing deformation, so they essentially cannot complete their uh, completion um, stages or their stages planned because they cannot come back into the wellbore. Okay. So uh, the other thing that happens, and this is another type of modeling that we are doing, because in the previous we are essentially imposing a geometry of the hydraulic fracture in the continuum model to uh, calculate the stresses generated when you put that hydraulic fracture there. We're not modeling propagation or anything. But in this type of discrete element model, we are, uh, we can, we don't have to prescribe any geometry. The, the hydraulic fracture will, will take the geometry that uh, the physics of the problem dictates. So in the case of hydraulic fractures that are uh, with a good enough distance, they don't interfere and you have two plan or flat fractures. But when the fractures are too close, then the second fracture, or in this case the third fracture, will take a cone shape. And this is something that is not a good situation for uh, cropping the hydraulic fractures. So you would like to have this planar type of hydraulic fractures. In this case, we're not really uh, taking care of the natural fractures, but these shapes definitely can take place uh, in the field. Okay, another thing that happens uh, in this unconventional is now talking about the effect of natural fractures is the following. We did a simulation, in this case, uh, with uh, discontinuum mechanics as well. And this would be the plane of the main hydraulic fracture that, imagine, is intersected by a lot of natural fractures. As you pump in this uh, system, uh, some of the fluid is going to go to open this main hydraulic fracture plane, and some of the fluid will go to open the natural fractures, right? So because of the heterogeneity of the system, you know, the difference in properties and apertures of these natural fractures, you don't get a very monotonic 
uh, geometry, the conventional, like the PKN model, in, we, in which you have an elliptical uh, shape of the of the hydraulic fractor, you may get this distribution of apertures in that hydraulic fractor plane, which is again uh, a, a challenge to put propant in that fracture plane. Okay, so this is something that we're observing in our model. Okay, so wrapping up complexity, we introduced the concept uh, concept of stress shadows. Uh, or increase in the, in the minimum stresses, minimum horizontal stresses because of the presence of uh, stages that we are putting in the horizontal wellbore. Small spacing may cause stabilization of natural fractures instead of promoting stimulation, and uh, these stress shadows may cause stress rotation. <clears throat> okay, so let's go now to the concept of simulated rock volume. So we want to have all these natural fractures connecting to the main hydraulic fracture and to the well bore so we have a better production, right? And remember we have nano Darcy, we don't get them, we're gonna need 60 stages to, to have an economic well. So we want to promote this uh, complexity and we want to have this simulated rock volume as the biggest possible. So uh, we are doing in the industry, we're using the micro seismic as a measure of this volume that is connected to the well board. But what we're seeing is that we're measuring this cloud, as I showed you in the Barnet, but the production of the wells are reflecting a much smaller volume uh, that's connected to the well board, right? Mostly like 50% or so. Uh, of what we're measuring with the micro seismic. So we did some modeling to try to calculate this micro seismic and uh, try to uh, compute this volume. And remember, you know, and we talk about it, what we can hear uh, when the rock fails through micro seismic events are the shear events, right? The tensile events are very hardly, um, determined because of the magnitude that's very low. So what we hear is the rock failing in shear. That's what we're getting with all this, you know, nice dots in the micro seismic monitoring. Okay, so the question that we post is, if you have a micro seismic event, does that mean that that point there is connected back to the well bore? Or can we talk about some of the, these micro seismic events as wet events? Where meaning by that that the pressure has changed and the pressure change is what has caused that failure, or are there dry events caused by rock deformation, by this stress shadow effect and in increments of the stresses because of deformation of the whole system? So we run a model like the one that I'm showing you here, in which we imported all the DFN, all the natural fractures, which are here in blue. We uh, put all boundary conditions and all that. We define the hydraulic fracture plane. We put injection line simulating a well bore. And we monitored uh, in the model the changes in pore pressure, changes in aperture, and also where we were obtaining uh, failure, both tensile and uh, shear failure. In this case, we may uh, imagine these dots as micro seismic events, right? We're, we're going to be able just to monitor the green, not the red. But the most important thing that we're seeing here is that the, the failure, in other words, the micro seismic event can occur away from the pressure front. In this case, all these colors are where the pore pressure uh, is changing, but then we have failure very far where there's no pore pressure change. So what we did in this model was to count the events that were uh, dry and the ones that were wet as a function of a fluid viscosity. But we did some parametric analysis, but I'm going to present just the uh, effect of viscosity in this dry-wet event ratio as a function of time, 
And, uh, you know, this is a very complicated uh, graph, but the summary is that when you have very high viscosity, you have this, uh, for every 100 uh, wet events, you have 87 dry events. When you go lower than uh, to a lower viscosity, like slip water type of viscosity, you still have 10%. So this has a, a big impact and implication on the interpretation of this stimulated rock volume. Like, not every event that you see may be related to a connectivity back to the well book. So uh, this is an important thing because we can have, uh, be overestimating the extent of fluid penetration from this uh, interpretation of the stimulated rock volume. Right, so in other words, I have put just three of the concepts that are used, used very widely in the industry that when you look at them through the geomechanics, uh, sometimes can be deceiving. So you have to understand what's going on. Okay, so the last part of my presentation is about the numerical models that uh, can help us design and can help us understand um, the problem. So right now in the industry, we're using these biplanners, pseudo 3D frac models, and we're somehow making some tricks to make this work for us. Uh, they run faster, but uh, essentially what we're seeing here is that that hydromechanical coupled behavior is not being taken into account, and also the thermal part is important, and we think that that physics is critical to be able to um, to make predictions. And the other thing we would like to have is include or incorporate the micro seismic data in a quantitative mod uh, way to the interpretation in the modeling and design. And for that, we're going to, to use, to the use of discrete elements or um, this type of models that I'm gonna to talk to you about in just a second, okay? So the starting point, is uh, the description of the fractal rock mass. We need a DFN, even if it's conceptual, we can translate that into some. Sound and reasonably correct, right from the geological point of view. So we start with our DFN, distribution of fractures in the media, and we may use different type of models. I showed to you some continuum mechanics and some discrete element mechanics. This, this would be a representation of this pseudo 3D rule-based type of models. Uh, we think that in these two cases, we don't have the physics. Here we may uh, represent the coupling and we represent the physics in a better way. So when we use this discrete element models, we have uh, several options. One of the options that we're using is the what we call bonded particle models in which the system is discretized in spheres that have bonds and you can uh, assign properties or micromechanical properties to these bonds to represent the macroscopic uh, mechanical and hydraulic and thermal behavior. And you can also import your DFN model and prescribe uh, the fractal planes with their properties, right? So this is a very uh, powerful type of model, but it's very computationally intensive and because uh, here we have a logic as well for fluid flow of uh, tubes and reservoirs that is powerful too, but it's very, very time consuming. So we went to what we call lattice models in which we take away some degrees of freedom of, of the spheres of the particles and don't let them rotate, so take away some moments, and this is a simplification, but uh, essentially you can build the same, what we call synthetic rock mass with this type of uh, logic. And then we have also the block models, uh, which are simpler and faster, and uh, we discretize the medium and blocks, and the interfaces between blocks are the fractures but we don't have fluid flow in the blocks. So in the previous two models, you have fluid flow in the system, in the matrix, and in the fractors. In this type of block models, we have a fluid flow just in the fractors, okay? So armed with these tools, 
uh, we're doing uh, some interesting analysis. And, um, you know, just to, to be very simplistic, the discrete element models, um, the meaning of this is that each element, each uh, zone that you're considering acts, uh, acts as an independent element. So we are tracking the contact in this element uh, time step by time step, and you can take away when failure occurs uh, that particle out of the system and, it, and, and, and continue with this modeling. But the most important thing that we're doing with this uh, discrete element models is that we are creating or computing synthetic microseismic. Every time uh, a bond breaks, you can calculate the resultant forces, that the changes in forces that are resulting from this uh, bond breakage and uh, determining the energy that's released and translating that into a microseismic event uh, for which we can determine the magnitude, the time it occur, and also um, even the direction of slippage of this surface. In other words, the focal mechanisms as well. So we have a quantitative way or calculation that we can compare back to field measurement and use it to calibrate your model, either your DFN or your mechanical properties and so on, and have a better chance to have a predictive model. Okay, so um, now I'm going to show some uh, very quick examples of how we are using these tools, several of those. For example, this is a, a top view of a, um, of a defeat of a test, a small-scale injection test in which microseismic was measured, and we were able to match reasonably well the field and the calculated microseismic, modifying the intensities and properties of the DFN. Uh, we also did some examples of uh, progressive or um, progressive stages of hydraulic fracturing and calculating the microseismic produced along the horizontal well bore and use that to calibrate uh, the, the model using location, magnitude, and time. And also we have done some examples uh, at a smaller scale to uh, study the effect of the interfaces in the propagation of the hydraulic fracture. For example, here this is the main hydraulic fracture. All these little blue disks are the bunts when they break and uh, create a, a hydraulic fracture. But then when it encounters the, the natural fracture, in some cases, depending on all the operational and geometries and properties, you may grow along the natural fracture or you may cross it. So this type of analysis we're doing. In this case, these little arrows are the displacement vectors, right? So uh, we are analyzing in this, in this case, this is a block model, the effect of viscosity in the type of failure you can induce. Um, in other words, the complexity is higher when we use low viscosity fluids. We have a lot of uh, green shear failure, as in this case. Excuse me. <coughs> Just a second. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to when you have a higher viscosity fluid in which you promote the what we call the mode one failure, in other words, the opening of uh, the main hydraulic fracture. So, and then um, uh, this is an example of a, like a field case in which we imported our fracture network and we are able to uh, monitor apertures changes in, in fracture pressure in the natural fracture system and the shear displacement magnitudes. Okay, and uh, to end, the last part of the capability of the models that we're working on is in reversing the models, like uh, we can calculate uh, aperture changes and pressures during the injection, but we're also trying to get it during production and then upscaling the changes in permeability at different times of production 
uh, you know, either using changes in permeability, uh, directional permeability, or either like a double porosity uh, models, uh, superimposing like a mesh and calculating this changes in permeability. So this can be used by a, a reservoir simulation uh, model to predict production at uh, other scales. So well, this uh, concludes my presentation. Let's uh, just uh, put some conclusions here quickly. Um, I hope I have convinced you that geomechanics is a critical part of the completion optimization in unconventionals. This couple hydromechanical behavior is complicated, but it can be a Uh, the synthetic microseismic is a critical part of the quantitative calibration of the models. Beware of some of the empirical knowledge. Uh, and of course, we have some caveats. And you know, our current models can, uh, for hydraulic fracturing in the conventional air arena, can run in 10 minutes, right? This is not the case here. These tools are very computationally intensive. So the strategy is to use these tools on a resource basis for optimization and for understanding what are the critical parameters that are that are influencing our completions and our production, and then finding the ways to optimize this. So, well, thank you very much. And uh, you know, any questions? This is the time. Questions or complaints? Not a problem. Okay, well, great. Um, let me, uh, <clears throat> Marcel, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> I'm going to unmute um, Steve and Abe, who are also on the line as well. Uh, and okay. we'll open up to the class uh, here or uh, for the online participants for any questions. So, yeah, you might have to speak up just a little bit so Marcel can hear you. Okay. So, you mentioned brittleness as one of the Common knowledge things that maybe could lead us astray. What are some yes. of the other um, empirical knowledge that the industry is using that maybe you think isn't so accurate or helpful? Yeah. So, any? Uh, do you hear the rest of that question? So no, I did not. So brittleness is a is you mentioned as a problem. Is there any other empirical knowledge that? Um, you know, causes a problem for your simulations? Uh, well, the other thing is, you know, the brittleness issue that everybody's spending so much money on it and we don't really get it uh, from as the way, in the way that it's used. And so we are like, you know, warning people, hey, you know, go after fracture intensity, go after understanding your geometry and, um, conceptually how your fracture uh, rock mass is. But the other thing that we're looking a lot, we're seeing a lot is uh, put more stages. Put them like, uh, you know, these schemes of uh, making hydraulic, uh, hydraulic fractures and then coming back and put uh, additional in between that what, what's called like the Texas two-step, the zipper fract, a lot of uh, very complex completion schemes uh, that have not been proven to increase production and uh, very little modeling to try to understand that how they might behave. And, uh, you know, sometimes service companies are selling, uh, you know, HP, selling more fractures, selling more propens. And uh, from the operator's point of view, you have to get the op optimum and not really, you know, go after the fashion, but try to understand uh, what's really going on. So that would be something else. And then I think one of the most uh, critical challenges, what are we going to do with the micro seismic? It's like uh, now many, many of our clients are saying, okay, that's pretty pictures, but what, are, what am I getting really from the micro seismic? Spending, you know, a lot of money uh, getting this information and uh, we just have the pretty pictures like dots in a box. So I would say those are the ones um, 
from the geomechanics point of view that we have to be aware of. Okay, great. Any Spencer has a question? Yeah, so I was I was wondering what what have you guys seen has been the best um, completion fluid to use? Or have what do we need in terms of what completion? I didn't hear well. Uh, like completion fluids. Like what 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 you're throwing in to complete it? What have you guys done a study on on what's been the best for that in these shales? Okay, so what do you need, what do you want to do is number one question. Do you want to create more complexity? Do you want, or you want to create bigger hydraulic, larger hydraulic fractures and more conductive hydraulic fractures? So you can play with your com completion fluids. It's like the models are telling us, and the field is telling us as well, that when you use uh, low viscosity fluids, you may get, more participation or more cooperation, let's call it that way, of the natural practice system because it's easier with a less viscous fluid to get that fluid in the practice, right? And the other thing that many operators are using is a combination of uh, injection schemes to allow this pressure to get as far as possible in the, in the rock mass. If you really go faster, you're going to promote the creation of a single hydraulic fracture. If, if you get pumping rates and conditions of fluid viscosity such that you promote the penetration, the infiltration, then you're going to get more frac natural fractures to shear, right? Sometimes we've seen cases of clients that are asking, hey, I don't see much fractures, but my wells are producing, what's the mechanism? How are we connecting to this discontinuity? So we have seen that maybe it's the bedding planes who are um, helping us to connect the few fractures that are around the wellbore. And then we can, you know, use the models. It's a, I would say, cheaper way than go and try an error and try whatever type of schemes uh, in the field to try to understand what's the effect of the fluid type. Right, so um, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thanks, Maricela. Um, any other questions? We have one more quick question, Kyle. So you mentioned um, that you don't have a lot of data to work with. What kind of data would be more valuable for, for making your simulation studies? Yeah, I couldn't hear the question, Johnny. Okay, if you can so repeat. You said, uh, you, know, you said you don't have a lot of data. What data would be <laughs> most useful for helping your simulation studies? Okay. So the most critical data is the fractal network, the DFN. So we have to have a client say, yes, I'm going to spend the money and taking the image log and the cores and building this DFN and constraining it and, you know, uh, make a good job in describing the DFN. Some others say, no, I'm not going to do that. It's so complex that I'm not going to spend the money. And then there's very little we can do with the models if we don't have a description, at least conceptual, geologically sound description of how the fractures are distributed. Because uh, one thing, uh, the most, I think the case that we're making is that the natural fracture system is the commanding, the commander factor in how these wells behave. So we need to get that data. That's the most important. Then the mechanical properties, we have ranges we can play with. It's like there's experimental data that's telling us, you know, in this shale, this type of shales, we are ranging between 10 to 20 uh, uh, degrees in friction angle, or you can vary that to friction coefficient. We have some uh, variability on other properties, but we, have, we can constrain that. But how the natural factors are distributed is the critical, critical factor. Okay, well, good. Well, thank you, Marcella, for presenting. And let's give her one more uh, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, great. It was great. And uh, I'm very happy to be able to, to give this talk to you guys. And, uh, you know, any questions or comments? I'll be happy to be in contact, be in touch through email, and you know you can ask uh, John and to pass on that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Maricela. Okay, bye-bye, okay. guys.